Today we're going to discuss the petechial rash. Three years ago, I was on service at Johns Hopkins Hospital with a team of learners and we had a patient with a lower extremity petechial rash. As a diagnostician, I got very excited and I shared my approach to the petechial rash and I told the learners, consult dermatology because we're going to need a skin biopsy. They consulted dermatology and they did not perform a skin biopsy. Stay tuned for the end of this video to know what their recommendation was. And why am I teaching this to you? So you don't make the mistake that I made. Welcome back clinical problem solvers. It's Prof Rez, a clinician in Chicago who loves learning and teaching. This channel is dedicated to understanding physiology and pathophysiology in the context of medical topics. Today's topic, the petechial rash. The thing to note about the petechial rash is that it's a non-blanching rash. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you took a clear ruler and you pressed it against the patient's erythematous rash, the rash will persist. It won't fade away. Why does this happen? It happens because red blood cells have left the blood vessel. And so when you push down on that rash, you're not pushing those red blood cells back in. So your job now is to determine what pathology has led to the extravasation of red blood vessels. This comes into two buckets. And although I'm going to break this down into two buckets, remember, you can have multiple mechanisms that lead to the petechial rash. Either there's an issue at the vessel wall or there's an issue with hemostasis. Press pause. What are some examples of issues with hemostasis that can lead to the petechial rash? Well, if you have an issue with platelets, let's say you have a low platelet count like ITP, or you have a qualitative platelet disorder that may occur in the setting of renal disease. Clotting factors. What if you have an issue with your clotting factors? This too can lead to the petechial rash. That's why we send a platelet level and a PT and PTT in a patient with a petechial rash. But let's say hemostasis is normal. Now we bring our attention to the vessel. This is the most exciting part of the diagnostic journey, but it's also the most challenging part. Because you need to determine, does someone have a vasculitis? Or do they have a non-inflammatory vasculopathy? Meaning no inflammation, but pathology of the blood vessel. Let's target, let's, let's tackle the vasculopathy first, the non-inflammatory vasculopathy. What are some common examples? Trauma. We've all have had trauma that has led to some form of bruising. And bruise it, bruising is nothing more than a large petechiae. Remember, it goes petechiae, purpura, ecchymosis, all the same process, just the size varies. Patients who age are more vulnerable to developing purpura because the vessels just lose their integrity. In fact, everything worsens as we age. Um, that is known as senile purpura. Another example, amyloid. Someone with systemic amyloidosis, remember we did a video on amyloid. I'm gonna include it in a card, please check it out. But someone with amyloidosis, this can infiltrate the vessel wall leading to compromise of its integrity and the extravasation of red blood cells. Scurvy. Scurvy is low vitamin C. Low vitamin C, vitamin C is necessary for collagen, which is necessary for the integrity of the vessel wall. So if you have low vitamin C, you can have a particular rash. And finally, collagen vascular disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Because again, if there's an issue with collagen, there's an issue with the vessel and you can get leaking of the red blood cells. How can we determine if someone has a vasculitis? Usually you have to do a skin biopsy, but there's definitely clues that may point to this. You can ask the question, is your patient inflamed? So you look for systemic signs of inflammation. For example, does your patient have a fever? Is the white blood cell count elevated? What about the ESR and CRP? All markers of inflammation. Another clue to vasculitis is if that particular rash is palpable. We've heard the term palpable purpura. How can you determine if a rash is palpable? Well, wear your gloves, close your eyes, 
and see if you can palpate the contours of the rash. If you can palpate the contours of the rash, then you're dealing with palpable purpura, which points to vasculitis. The absence of palpable purpura doesn't eliminate the possibility of vasculitis, but its, pres its presence confirms it. So how are we going to think about vasculitis? You should, whenever you're considering vasculitis, in addition to asking the question, is the patient inflamed, ask the question, are there other organs that are involved? Because typically vasculitis affects multiple organs. What organs? Well, the kidney, the lung, the GI tract, and the nerves. And we'll list examples of each of these while we sort of expand on vasculitis. And, and by the way, we're talking about the lower extremity petechial rash, so this would be a small vessel vasculitis. This category, you can break up into posse immune, posse immune, or immune complex mediated. What does this, what does this mean? It means when you do a biopsy and you study it with immunofluorescence, you're either gonna see immune complexes, that's antibodies complement, or you're not gonna see immune complex. Posse means few, so this means very few, a paucity of immune complexes. This category is really easy to remember because this is our ANCA-associated vasculitides, which include MPA, GPA, EGPA, and even drug-related. Remember when I was saying look for other organ involvement? All of these can involve the lung uh, through diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or the kidney through glomerular nephritis. They can even involve the nerves. What are examples of immune complex mediated um, vasculitis? You can think about IgA vasculitis, cryo. We've done a video on cryo. I'll also include that in the card. Check it out. Cryo is very interesting. Um, and this can affect multiple organs as well. Lupus, Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis. You see, I've lumped all those together as like a memory aid for my mind. Um, other things to consider here include endocarditis, perineal plastic syndromes, and even hypersensitivity vasculitis, which is a term that's falling out of favor, but basically drug-related vasculitis. The mechanism isn't completely understood. So let me summarize. When you're approaching the petechial rash, ask yourself, is there any issues with the hemostasis system, platelets, clotting factors? If no, or even if so, are there issues with the vessel? And when you get to the vessel, you gotta distinguish inflammatory vas vasculitis from non-inflammatory vasculopathy. We discussed a bunch of examples of vasculopathy, and then we said when we're considering vasculitis, we asked the question, is the patient inflamed, which may manifest with the fever and laboratory abnormalities? Does the patient have palpable purpura, which is pointing us to vasculitis? And then once we get to vasculitis, we can break it down into posse immune and immune complex mediated. So what did the dermatologist say to me? Basically, they came and evaluated the patient, and they said, this patient does not need a skin biopsy. Why? Well, my patient had low platelets, and we had compression stockings on the patient's leg because they had low platelets. We didn't want to use pharmacologic deep venous thrombosis prophylaxis. With the low platelets and the trauma from the compression stockings, my patient had developed a petechial rash. So you know what the dermatologist said? They said just remove the compression stockings and probably that the patient should have had a smarter doctor. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Remember, work hard today so you're smarter tomorrow than you were yesterday. Thank you.